We hope that you've enjoyed listening to uh, those that have come before you. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say with your message to us in this fight for justice for young people and uh, our fight to make politics, peace and equality uh, something that we can all uh, treasure in our lives. So John, please.
he said, well, it's just a complete hangover from a previous Cold War. You know, you've got kids with rucksacks jumping on tubes. They're the real threat. It's not like these great big weapons of mass destruction. Get rid of it. Save the liver. How much you say? Under a billion pound? Not an insignificant amount of money. And start investing in young people in communities, get people a house, all this sort of self-evident stuff. And afterwards, I was with a mate of mine, because he, he, he mentioned Ron Todd, because he always had quite an eye on Ron Todd, my dad, even though from time to time he thought Labour was mad, but he was a Labour voter, Labour bloke. And uh, he, uh, he reminded me, and I dug out one of Ron's old poems. Now, I don't know, someone mentioned he was a poet, but he was a bloody good poet, actually. And he, he used to write some poems about the tyranny of nuclear weapons, and they made it in a very concrete, practical way. So the night before we had this fight, I remember reading the Ron Todd poem about nuclear proliferation. It was very, very moving, actually. And I, I had a bit more time with that. I'd gone back and got it and read it out. Because what he used to do is just send these booklets of poems out to his place. Right? And people he met across the whole globe. Because he was an extraordinary internationalist. Extraordinary internationalist. He was chair of TBC International Committee for many, many years. And he was a great mate of Nelson Mandela. He, he was pioneering in his fight against apartheid uh, and what he did. And he, he forged a great friendship with Nation Mandela. But what always interested me about him, he was just such an ordinary bloke. He was such an ordinary bloke. I remember, I always see him as a honest English patriot, actually. And I mean that in the best possible way. Um, I was listening to Ed Miliband's speech at the Labour Party Conference just this last week, and he was talking about one nation, patriotism, and Labour patriotism. And I see Adley, Hardy, Lansbury, Todd, these great patriotic Labour movement figures that were trying to contest what the country could be, rather than just handing it over to those who think they're born and rolled and usually do spend most of their time ruling over us. And um, I was thinking about that as I was listening to Ron, uh, Ron Todd, <laughs> not like Ron Todd, um, Ed Miliband <laughs> this week. And um, I'll tell you what I remember when Ed Miliband was talking about patriotism and Labour was Ron Todd's funeral memorial service took place in Dagenham Redbridge Football Club in the middle of my constituency in 2005, I guess 2005, yeah. And um, Ron, as a veteran, there was a, we had the Dagenham Royal British Legion, we had the Royal Marines, we had the Royal Naval Association give this guard of honour, right, as his coffin was brought into. It was an extraordinarily powerful thing. And, you, you, and there was this, Jack Jones gave this, the great union leader, Jack Jones gave this extraordinary speech there, Tony Benn was there, Gordon Brown, and it was a real Labour moment thing. But the, the generational thing you couldn't lose, where all, many of those people who had put uniforms on, Jack Jones had been in, in the 30s in the International Brigade in Spain, and, you know, there was that strong relationship between patriotism, what a country could be, socialism, and a real extraordinary humanity. Which never lost it. I remember uh, it wasn't just that uh, he spoke of and understood and was embedded in the working class. He, 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 that, they, we also honoured him. I remember we have a street, I was around there the other week actually, with a street called Long Todd Close in Dagenham, originally. It's not far from George Lansbury Street, actually. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting how these great pioneers of labour actually honoured by their own communities because they didn't disappear away from. Charts. He used to live around the corner from the football club until he died of leukemia in 1970. So he had 78, I think he was, when he died. Was 78? He must have been late 70s, yeah. And um, what would happen, because I was his MP, you see, so what would happen, he would ring up, he'd leave messages, he'd ring my office all the time, and it usually consisted of him going out to get his paper in the morning and meeting someone, and it was in Reed Road, I remember this news agency used to go, and he'd talk to anyone. And he'd find oh. out what's going on and what problems they have. And then he'd ring me and he'd go, look, I found a problem. And it was literally all the time he would be sending in these messages to me or telling me what he the new orders, um, explaining it. I remember that was Jack Jones was there as well when we launched World Tour Close in, in Dagenham. And Lenny McCluskey, who's now the General Secretary of the United, was there, a council leader. And what it is, because why he reminded me of George Lansby so much was because the hallmark of it was his total honesty and integrity. And it spoke of a working class that is often not talked about much anymore, actually, um, in this language of celebrity and, you know, the X Factor and all that. We saw it with a wife swap and all that. It's, it was very
very different to the class that he understood, talked about. Um, and he was also a member of our retired members T and G branch. And every, after every meeting, he'd always be on the phone to me then saying, "Look, you've got to get this kitchen sorted out for all this group." The point about it is, he was the friend of Nelson Mandela, the massive, powerful trade union leader who commanded that political stage. But to him, it was about your neighbour. That's what it was all about. It was all about. I told Dylan Thomas once had a phrase about the Labour movement. He said, the Labour movement at its best is magical and parochial. Magical and parochial. It's embedded in the everyday culture. It represents it, understands it, and honours it, respects it. And that's what he was like. He was murder, actually, to be the MP for, because he would be on me all the time about planning issues, about neighbour problem, about a garden, about something or other, you know, kids' education. And he couldn't leave it alone. He had to take it up, because he thought everyone should have a fair cut at it, just like he was talking about, about, like, everyone has a, it's about the dignity of the human being, actually. And everyone was, no one was irretrievable. Everyone deserved it. Um, and his granddaughter was walking the same streets, making sure that everyone did have a fair go at it, even those that society wrote off. So I was a massive fan of Ron Todd. I was extraordinarily privileged. I was just thinking about this today when I was making some notes about this. I was extraordinarily privileged to be at his last ever public speech. And there was about a third of the amount of people that there are here tonight. It was in Dagenham Lake Hall in Tenterton Road. It was in 2005. At the time, we had the BNP all over our streets. Right? It was really, really bumpy. Really bumpy. And um, we had a meeting in our Labour Hall to talk about what we were going to do because what became the first ever BNP councillor in London after Derek Beacon got elected on the Isle of Dogs 15 years before he, he lost. Um, and then we, there was a BNP, the, the first ever. London BMP Council got elected in Goldsbrook in uh, Barking. And we had a meeting to campaign and organise against it. And Ron gave his last ever speech there. And there must have been about 15 in this room. And I can still see it there. He would stand up and he would shake him with anger and uh, the urgency of the situation. He knew he was dying. He knew he was dying. But he just, he just, he had such passion about what had to happen. He was shaken as he forced us on that night um, because he thought that, and he talked about the perils of fascism, his own experience, how the far right had scavenged around working class communities, pitched one group against another, and it was born of a passion and a belief about the human condition and what people could be that he urged us on last night, that night. He had this energy and vitality even when he was dying about what a country could be. And what we had to fight literally on the streets. A principal, honest patriot. I would sit and visit him many, many times in his house, and I'd just have to listen because he would go on and on and on. He could literally talk for Britain. And um, it was about his politics, his country, his experiences, his international experiences. He would show me, show me his many collections. He was an avid collector of all sorts of things. He would uh, send me his poetry, which is very good. He would send me even though he was described as a dinosaur, he was very knowledgeable about fossils. Right? And he would send me, because he knew my son was very interested, all boys were interested in dinosaurs, he would send me books and fossils for my boy. Um, he was extraordinarily kind. Um, and he hated New Labour. Hated it. Um, and I was to him a representative of New Labour. But it was never about malice. It was all about loss of what he thought a party could be. It was out of sadness rather than anger, personal anger. Um, as he said, it was brought up family of market traders and all from stuff. Um, I never knew that he actually served in the Marines with his father. So I didn't know that. They were on the same camp at one stage, which I only sort of learned about the other day. Um, there was a Jeffrey Goodman who, who wrote his actual obituary in the Guardian, who was the industrial correspondent of the Mirror, who actually was much more than that, actually. He was best friends with Anaran Bevan. He, he 
was an extraordinary act. He is 94 still, Jeffrey. And because I was coming up here, I thought I'd go to bed. He's a mate of mine. And uh, he talked to me about Ron the other day for a cup of coffee. And he told me this amazing story about when Don Ron was in the Dagenham car plant, which he was until 62, where he became a full time official of the union. There was always a story about his personal integrity, whereby his older brother worked on the same site and it was higher up in the union. And he said, look, to make some more money, why don't you do more shift work at night and then you can wing it on a couple of shifts. Bob's your uncle. And he got very angry and a real row with his brother because he would refuse to do that. Such was his level of personal integrity that he would have nothing off swinging the lead or playing the game. And I thought that was quite revealing because the other thing that you mentioned was, was when he became the leader of the TNG. There was George Wright, who was his opponent from the Welsh region, so it was a right-left thing. Ron was always at the left in the Labour Party. And uh, they said he, they'd bring the ballot. And Moss Evans, who, who took over from, um, advised him to carry on and just kept, just, just fight through it. That, you know, don't, don't have another ballot. But Ron refused that and forced the union into another ballot, which we came out with 75,000, I think, for the majority, rather than 40,000. It was, it was total vindication of what he said, but it demonstrates the personal integrity of the man. The actual story that stands out the most in terms of his personal integrity and his pioneering mindset, actually, was he broke the rules of the union once. And uh, I think people don't quite realise this, that in, in Jeffrey was telling me, when Bill Morris, who was his deputy, uh, when Ron was going to retire, they, uh, the FNGP, the very powerful committee of the union, which would nominate who would be the candidate, so, so said that Bill couldn't stand, basically because he was black. And Ron refused to accept it. He refused to accept that, and he forced the FNG people to, against the rules of the union, because he said, we cannot have any trouble with this, just on the principle of it. But in the end, the union ended up with electing the most powerful black man in Britain. In terms of the union. So again, testimony to his extraordinary personal integrity, resilience, and the principles of the man were frightening actually because um, it was actually described and, and talking to Jeffrey it was he was said um, the trouble with Ron is that he is too bloody honest was a phrase that was used so many times about him, both in the union the broader Labour Party and uh, the trade union movement um, and I think it's difficult that to be totally incorruptible and it being criticism of you that you're too bloody honest says a little more about the society than it does about the individual characteristics of the man. There was one historic moment in the trade union labour movement was from Eric Hammond who ran the engineering union. Um, electrician. Electrician junior, sorry. Electrician junior, it was electrician junior. And um, after he had a big, big row with the, with, uh, the TNG in East London around Wapping. But before that, he castigated the miners and he accused them as being lions led by donkeys, was his phrase. And I think many people in this room might well remember when Ron jumps up onto the podium straight after and he said, I prefer to be a donkey than a jackal, Eric. And it's just an <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary moment that, that went right through, put like jump leads across the whole, because it, it cut through what, what, what was that question of integrity across the Labour and Trade Union movement at its best. But it did demonstrate his total incorruptibility. But probably the greatest row he had, and is remembered for, is a row in 1988 with Neil Kinnock. We were like Kinnock in 1987, had lost, we lost three in a row against Margaret Thatcher. And so we started what we called the modernisation of the Labour Party, which is basically moving it into the centre ground, trying to cut off some of the more traditional class basis of what the Labour Party was. And there was a very famous tribune rally at the 1988 conference where Ron made a speech just after Kimmon, which was castigating about this modernisation. Castigating. And it was primarily about universal nuclear disarmament, actually, because that was the one thing, because of Frank Cousins, who had been running the union before, was the one thing that he would never trade off. He was a great pacifist, patriot, unilateralist, and he never saw any distinction between the three. They were all part of the same thing, which is very interesting because it wasn't a, it's was quite a muscular form of patriotism where you take it on and say the country could be better than to have a nuclear weapons ground. Anyway, he made this speech at 1988 tribute around the night, I think it was the night that Kinnock made his speech, and there was a terrible fallout where Ron was running around saying that the Labour Party was just led by people in expensive suits running around with file of in their hands, right? It was going too far. And it was very interesting.
interestingly that Manchester this week, Ed Miliband is now sort of trying to unpack that and say the Labour Party has cut itself in for too far away and we need more working class representatives in the Labour Party. So we've sort of gone full circle. And it's strange that some of these unfashionable things that Ron Todd stood for are strangely fashionable again now. Like, is spending £100 billion on a tried nuclear weapon system. A rational thing, given the austerity and retrenchment, just like he was talking about earlier on. So I always find it, actually there's a real case for rehabilitating Ron Todd for the Labour Party now. Because he seems very contemporary to me. And not a dinosaur, even though he was a paleontologist. You know, he, he was a, is that the right word, paleontologist? Anyway, he was an extraordinary figure. I, um, uh, he intimidated me, Ron Todd. Being his MP was very difficult, actually, because he was forever chasing him. And he was tireless. And he was, uh, he was a uh, unscrutable, principal, total integrity. And, but he would talk and listen and he, he would offer advice to anyone. So with Kinnock, it wasn't personal. It was never personal. It was just about uh, that sense of loss about what the party could be. And that sense of drift and decline away from what he thought the Labour Party should be and who it should be for. The little guy, the person who picks up the bill, you know, the, the guy who plays by the rules and gets drop kicked, you know, thought that everyone should have a crack, a fair crack at it. I, um, I always said, there was a great writer who said, um, the task is to give the ordinary its beautiful day. And Ron Todd, because he was so embedded in the working class and understood it and was respected by it, he could speak about the ordinary things in the world. Uh, and he would be unbending in his principal commitment to things, often the most unfashionable of things, but he just saw it as right, as how he was brought up. Um, and I think all politicians got a lot to learn about it. And to me, it goes back to what Labour could be. So, Labour at its best is a patriotic party that looks after everyone. It is literally a one nation party. So, its most important day for me, for Labour, was in 1940 when Clement and Greenwood joined the wartime coalition supporting Churchill against those in his own party that wanted to sue for peace with the fascists, actually. It was about building a new Jerusalem in 45 with Clement Attlee. And that's whilst, actually, I think in 45, Ron had started his trip to China. The, Japan. Um, and some of the things he saw there, I think, were left an indelible mark on it. So when I think about it, I just think about Dylan Thomas, that is, at its best, it is magical and parochial. One fine thing, there's a great philosopher called Raymond Williams who said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. To make hope possible rather than despair convincing. Ron was absolutely electrifying on speaking on behalf of the normal Joe. And he could make hope possible by the spare convincing. And we need a lot more of him today, given what this country is going to experience over the next few years. So it's a big credit to be It's a real privilege to speak about Ron Todd, because he is a hero of mine. He's strangely contemporary and fashionable to my man. And all power to you, both the Todd family, to keep it alive. There was a great railway leader in Australia called Ben Chifley. And he said, Labour is the light on the hill. The light on the hill. It was all about hope and well, so yeah, and Len could talk about, uh, Ron could talk about Labour as a light on the hill. They can't do today, and that's why despair is convincing and hope is not as possible as it should be. So thanks very much. It's great to be talking about Ron. Um, I think we should speak more about him because he crystallises a tradition of Labour that is often exiled, but it has to be brought back centre stage. So thanks, Tony. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. I, I intimated earlier on that you're currently leading the party's um, policy review. Uh, so we've given you a shot at this. We want the cancellation of crime, uh, more hope for young people, and reform, voter reform for prisons. Uh, so there's three you can put on the list straight away. But, um, uh, we have one more speaker, but I'm going to hold her back actually, if she doesn't mind, because I think um, our last speaker, Bianca, um, I think one. I think it's much better if she closes events tonight. And so uh, 